members of the select committee uh, on trade and competition, uh, employment and labor tourism. Recording in progress. So, and also uh, DTIC. Uh, the, the purpose of today's meeting is continuation of the public hearing on both the, the, two, the two bills, uh, the uh, uh, Farmers Protect, Protection Amendment Bill and also the Bread Amendment Bill. Uh, this is our third leg of the public uh, hearing. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, it's gonna be another long day, uh, but I think what is quite critical, the issue of public consultation and public uh, involvement in all legislation that uh, the uh, parliament in terms of part is quite uh, imperative and very important. Uh, but more than that also, it is important that uh, we also extend the word of greetings to all our uh, uh, participants that are on the platform. Uh, as you can see, that is the uh, lineup for, for today and uh, I understand that the, uh, as the presenter that is going to start is already on the platform, but maybe just to check with uh, Madia, are there any apologies that uh, you want to read? Yes, Chief. Chief, I can maybe just go through the members who are present um, with what yourself, um, Honorable Mashuri, Honorable Mamrahana, um, Honorable Bratusef, and Honorable Matavula. Um, and then we have also apologies from Honorable Dango um, and Honorable Boshoff, um, who's going into surgery today. Um, she says she's going to try and come in later, but I, given the fact that she's going to surgery today, maybe she might not be able to join us. And then we've also got standing apologies from um, our chairperson, Honorable Hai, and then also Mr. Honorable Lansman. In terms of our colleagues that we are present, present we've got my co-committee secretary, Ms. Denizulu, um, our committee assistant, Mr. Bazir, and Advocate Van Merva as well, our parliamentary legal advisor. Thank you, thank you. Let's not note those apologies. Uh, I'm also present, Aflin. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Honorable Abdelini. Uh, I suspect it's like because to of uh, you yourself. Of... <laughs> Jefferson Abdelini is present today, is announcing himself. Oh, uh, <laughs> I suspect it's because the, the gadget is not marked, uh, which was important for him to mark his presence. Thank you, Honorable Abdelini. Thank you, Honorable Mishodi. Uh, I. Even Honorable Dango uh, said he was going to undergo a procedure. So let's also uh, wish him well in that and also Honorable uh, for sure. Uh, honorable members uh, and also the um, PMG and also the media team on the platform and the public. Let's without any waste of time then uh, invite uh, Dr. Sanya some Tana and also Professor uh, Professor Peter uh, from the School of Law of uh, Northwest University. Dr. Sanya is from the University of uh, Vets. So without any waste of time, uh, this team I understand they'll be representing various uh, uh, academic institutions that were listed on the on the uh, program. So without any waste of time, the floor is yours. And you are welcome. Many thanks, Chairperson Moimang. Um, I trust that you can hear and see me. Yes, yes, we can see you. Thank you very much. I'm about to share my screen. Uh, so just bear with me for one moment. Thank you. Honorable members, I hope you can see my screen as well. Yes, we can see the screen. Fantastic, then I will begin my presentation. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members of the NCOP Select Committee on Trade, Industry, Economic Development, Small Business Development, Tourism, Employment and Labor. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before this committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Sanya Samtani. I am a senior researcher at the Mandela Institute at the University of Wits. And I'm an expert in copyright and human rights law in international and domestic law, India and South Africa specifically. I appear here along with my colleague, Professor Klaus Beter, 
and I speak on behalf of a coalition of copyright and constitutional law experts from these specific institutions. Uh, their names are on the screen uh, for your reference. Uh, we have also submitted a joint academic opinion that's in our written submissions that provides detailed textual recommendations on proposed amendments that we make, uh, suggestions that we make to the committee to amend the CAB. Our, our, our submissions in this instance build on two previous opinions which were submitted to the National Assembly's Portfolio Committee on Trade Industry and Competition. And those opinions have been published and can be accessed at the link on your screen. That's also been detailed in our written submissions in case people are interested to have a look at our previous submissions. Um, moving quickly on then to the context in this current case. Um, first of all, this process of copyright reform has been a long process to reform this apartheid era act, uh, 14 years approximately, starting in 2009. And this particular iteration of the bill has taken six years to get to this stage with extensive public participation. Now, the Constitutional Court in its recent judgment of 21 September 2022 noted that it is imperative that people living with disabilities, particularly visual and print disabilities, rectify their current unconstitutional situation. Now, I will be talking a little bit more about uh, what that situation is that has been created by the current Apartheid Era Act. Uh, and I will also talk a little bit about the Constitutional Court judgment. But suffice to say at this current stage that the court gave Parliament approximately 24 months from September 2022 to fix the Act, and there are only 18 months left, and so reform is currently urgent. Now, in particular, the Constitutional Court judgment noted that copyright reform to ensure that people with disabilities have access to accessible format works and are able to convert works into accessible formats is urgent. They, the court read in a particular provision into the current Apartheid Era Copyright Act in order to fix the current discriminatory position, and I will talk about that more in my submissions. The third point of context is that the Falem Commission documented the full extent of how iconic South African artists are dying in poverty, like Solomon Linda, for example, due to the lack of regulation specifically of collecting societies and copyright management organizations. We submit that the CAB seeks to fix this by co regulating collecting societies in sections 22B to F, and also to ensure that artists get fair remuneration for their work by providing protection against an unenforceable contractual terms in section 39B of the CAB. And we submit that the CAB succeeds in doing so. Another point of important context is that COVID-19 has exacerbated existing inequalities as well as the digital divide. We are currently living in the aftermath of almost two years of lockdown where we saw inadequate access to educational materials as well as to internet infrastructure, which has delayed the realization of the right to education for all. The Copyright Amendment Bill aims to fix that and also provides for clear direction on the preservation of cultural heritage by libraries, archives, museums, and galleries, so that we do not see a repeat of the grave loss of priceless cultural heritage in the 2020, that we saw in the 2021 UCT fires. The final point of context here is that South Africa is, part, is seeking to participate in the fourth industrial revolution, but unfortunately cannot do so with its current copyright laws, because its current copyright act, the apartheid era act, refers to obsolete technologies like facsimiles, for example, uh, that are rarely used in educational context and in other contexts, and also continues to prevent the use of new technologies for cutting edge research like data mining. My colleague, Professor Beta, will talk a little bit more about that in his recommendations at the end of this present, at the end of my presentation. In sum, we submit that the CAB promotes innovation and it also future proofs the law in bringing South Africa into the fourth industrial revolution and the digital era. So a short word on the CAB provisions that we do not comment on. There are certain provisions that we do not comment on as we submit that they require no change. In our submission, we are mindful of the constitutional imperative that all organs of state must respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights. This also extends to Parliament's lawmaking function across all subject matter, including copyright. At the same time, we understand that the Bill of Rights is not absolute and that Parliament may limit rights through a law of general application, such as the CAB, potentially, under certain conditions. 
where parliament exercises such a discretion to limit rights, it must do so in a way that the limitations are reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society and can thus pass constitutional muster. We submit that this particular approach, one that considers the impact of statutory copyright on the Bill of Rights, has been correctly taken by the National Assembly, has been considered uh, has been correctly taken by the National Assembly, and that considered as a whole, an appropriate balance has been struck between users and creators in the bill. We adopt the same approach in our submissions. We also submit that this, the provisions that we do not comment on, for example, sections 12A to D, section 19D, section 6A, 7A to F, 8A and 9A, all fulfill important rights in the Bill of Rights and are also in line with established international and comparative law, and therefore strike a fair balance as well. Moving now to the next part of my presentation to explain how we will be presenting our recommendations. So I will present amendments that we propose related to people with disabilities and the realization of constitutional rights. My colleague, Professor Klaus Beter, will present amendments relating to the right to research and fair use, as well as technological protection measures. Moving swiftly on to the first set of amendments that we propose in our written submissions. We propose that in order to avoid any interpretation that could lead to its unconstitutionality, Section 19D specifically be amended to comply with the Constitutional Court's judgment in the Blind Essay versus Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition. I introduced the case in my introductory, uh, in my introduction, but I'm going to continue now to explain it in a little more detail. In that case, the court held that the current Copyright Act of 1978 was unconstitutional to the extent that it discriminated against people with visual and print disabilities and violated their rights to equality, dignity, education, culture, and language. The court's ruling crucially turned on the fact that people with visual and print disabilities had to first ask for permission or authorization from the copyright holder, while people without such disabilities did not have to do so. To fix this, the court read in a section 13a that in effect removed this requirement and permitted explicitly accessible format shifting. Our submissions on section 19D aim to align the CAB with this court crafted remedy and therefore ensure the CAB's constitutionality. In specific, we recommend that uh, the NCOP amend the CAB to ensure that section 19D subsection one is operational immediately without the need for regulations. There are several paragraphs in the Constitutional Court judgment that denote that this is the constitutional case. Uh, paragraphs 102, 108, and 109 specifically of the Concord judgment make it clear that, that people's uh, rights to equality and non-discrimination, particularly blind people's rights, cannot wait any longer and require immediate redress. Second, we recommend that Section 19D2A be amended to remove barriers to sharing accessible format copies among the disability community in line with the court's ruling that people with visual and print disabilities must have the greatest latitude in order to access these materials to the same level as people without disabilities. And finally, we recommend that the reference to people with all disabilities be retained in section 19D to avoid the need for further litigation from other disability groups that are analogous to the disability groups that did in fact initiate the blind essay litigation. This is in line not only with the Bill of Rights, but also with the UN, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that South Africa ratified in 2007 and therefore has obligations to domestically put into place. I move now to the next set of amendments relating to people with disabilities and those concern uh, specifically the my apologies those concern specifically the technological protection measures now in relation to the technological protection measures as I had mentioned previously the constitutional court judgment turned on the requirement of authorization that limited people's people with disabilities capacity to access works at the same level as others. Now the provision that we have highlighted on the screen, as well as in our written submission section 28P2, that section reinstates that requirement of authorization that the Constitutional Court held to be unconstitutional and runs the risk of further adversely 
impacting people with, with disabilities and discriminating against them. I'll give you an, a concrete example. For instance, if a blind person were to buy a book on an ebook reader, they would necessarily need to remove the digital locks that exist that tie that ebook to that reader in order to convert it into a format that is accessible for them to actually read it. Now, that involves device shifting, and this provision effectively prevents such a thing, even for the purposes of anti discrimination, even for the purposes of realizing the rights of people with visual and print disabilities. So, we submit that. The, we submit in our written submissions as well that that particular requirement be deleted in order to comply with the constitutional court judgment. Now, in the event that Parliament does not seek to delete such a provision, we, we, we recommend that Parliament consider carefully the impact of this provision on people with visual and print disabilities and amend it in a way to ensure that the TPMs or the digital locks do not prevent people with disabilities from actually reading works to which they have lawful access, whether through a library or whether through the market. That brings me to the end of my part of the submissions. I now hand over to my colleague, Professor Klaus Peter. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Prof. Peter, over to you, please. Prof. Is Prof on the... Um, he's just been admitted to the platform now, Che. I think he was disconnected, but I've just admitted him back onto the platform. Okay, good. I also have a lot to see him, uh, so I might be, might be very dark for the team to see me. Prof? I'm back. Uh, welcome, Prof. The floor is yours. I just, got, I just got back to the room. We have load shading in... Just doing, but I'm just back. So, um, honorable members of the committee, I suppose, Sonia, it's my turn now. It is, Klaus. Please proceed. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Sonia. Now, now, this team welcomes the retention of the fair use provision as it is uh, at the moment. So, of course, the provision permits fair uses for purposes such as, and then it mentions purposes including research. So uh, we uh, welcome uh, the retention of this provision. However, we would uh, recommend a certain uh, amendment. I'll come to that in a, in a second. Now, our current law envisages fair dealing, not fair use, but there is no difference in principle between these two constructs in as far as the fair dealing or fair use test, you know, the fairness test is uh, concerned. The only difference really is that in the case of the fair use provision, you've got this, uh, these words saying purposes such as, and the importance of that is that it leaves open future conceivable uses, which could not be foreseen by the uh, drafters of the legislation, and though thus makes it unnecessary to amend the law in the future for a certain purposes, uh, such as uh, computational methods of analysis, uh, you know, which cannot be foreseen at the moment of drafting. Now we know, of course, that these computational methods of analysis are important, and uh, we would at this point rather recommend their inclusion, although they might be covered by the fair use as it is, we recommend their inclusion uh, on the one hand, just because of uh, legal security, also because these provisions are so important at this um, point in time. And then also, you know, if you compare the South African fair use provision in the bill with the US one, then there are differences. It's usually said that the US provision would cover uh, text and data mining, which is what we are essentially talking about. Uh, but uh, the South African provision as envisaged now, really uh, must be read together with the fair dealing provisions and therefore might be constructed a bit more narrowly. So it is advisable to just include the phrase, including uh, informational analysis. Uh, Sanya, the next slide, please. So uh, this is a publication, uh, this is drawn from a publication which recently appeared in uh, the prestigious journal Science. 
showing how copyright laws around the world are prepared for text and data mining. So here we can see the US with its fair use provision is prepared. Um, those countries shown in brown here are not prepared at all, and all the others are somewhere in the middle. So you see South Africa at the moment with its current Copyright Act is blue. Uh, we know that at the moment there is just a fair dealing provision envisaging research for private purposes and research. So, so this is very narrow. So clearly there's a need for the fair use provision encompassing also research, but it should also, from our perspective, include uh, computational methods, meaning text and data mining. Just to qu quickly say what text and data mining is, it is the use of uh, software computers to search vast amounts of data within seconds to make uh, uh, comparisons of similarities, dissimilarities, uh, correlations, for the purposes of research. So text and data mining was crucial in the process of developing COVID vaccines. South African law obviously should be prepared for this. Now text and data mining uh, needs access to uh, copyrighted materials and uh, it must be ensured that that is um, possible of course. Uh, Sanya, the next slide. So just also, just to confirm the importance more generally of the fair use clause in the current bill, how important it is from two perspectives, from that of development, the right to development, and on the other hand, that of international human rights protection. So this slide here, more particularly on the right to development. So the 2002 report of the UK for property rights uh, makes an interesting statement. And this is not really a commission of UK experts, but it was international experts, including, for example, Professor Carlos um, Correa, who heads uh, the South Center in Geneva now, representing the interests of the global South. So there he says, uh, or the report says, it is important for developing countries to be able to maintain or adopt broad exemptions for educational research and library uses. So this is really what the fair use uh, provision does. We must un understand that there is no one size fits all in intellectual property law. It always depends on your economic context. If levels of protection are uh, too uh, low, there will be no innovation and therefore also no dissemination. But if levels of protection are too high, uh, there will be no dissemination in the first instance, and therefore also no uh, innovation following. And in the case of poorer countries, developing countries such as South Africa, it is especially the access aspect that is so important. Uh, before there is no access, there cannot uh, be any creation. And uh, for access, you need lower protection of intellectual property rights. Uh, of course, this also applies to copyright. Yes, that is the slide dealing with international human rights law. So obviously you cannot read the three-step test of international copyright law in a restrictive fashion without having regard to international human rights law. So the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, which is also an agreement to which South Africa is a party, uh, must be taken into consideration when understanding the three-step test of international copyright law. And here we've got in Article 15 1B the provision that there is a right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. So this means the importance of research to create these benefits. Also for that reason, the fair use provision is important and its inclusion of research and as we recommend the provision on text and uh, data mining. Uh, Sanya, uh, I think let's go to the next slide, um, just to again confirm both the developmental and the human rights perspective. Um, this balanced interpretation of the three-step test declaration was drafted by the Max Planck Institute, inviting recommended copyright scholars from around the world, and it emphasizes, if you especially look here at point 3a, it says open-ended limitations and exceptions are not prevented by the three-step test. So the fair use provision is definitely legitimate under the three-step test. 
also here in point six, emphasizing that in constructing limitations and exceptions, it's important to have regard to the interests deriving from human rights and fundamental freedoms and other public interests, specifically referring here to also to scientific progress, that is uh, research. Uh, next slide, Sanya, and that is now the last point of our recommended uh, changes. Again, first referring to the report of the UK Commission, where it says that developing countries should ensure that their IP legislation and procedures emphasize to the maximum possible extent enforcement of IP law through administrative action and through the civil rather than the criminal justice system. This particularly concerns the provisions of the bill, which at the moment envisage criminal liability for cases where a person uh, makes, uh, imports, sells devices that may be used to circumvent technical protection measures. In our view, this should be changed. It, it concerns uh, uh, sections 27.5b and 280 of uh, the Copyright Act, which should be changed um, to make provision at the most for administrative or uh, civil liability, you know, like uh, claiming damages, fines, interdicts, but no criminal action. And um, the reasons for this are, again, uh, th there's two important reasons. The one is that criminal enforcement simply is very expensive and criminal uh, enforcement really requires uh, the practicalities uh, to do that. But much more important is the fact that criminal law is really the last measure a society should use uh, for uh, regulating its uh, affairs. It's a question whether there is societal consensus on the use of criminal measures. And I can assure you, if you were to do a survey among the public where the criminal law should be used, it would be quite clear that uh, there is no moral consensus on the use of uh, criminal liability. But also to say that this is supported by international law. If you look at the TRIPS agreement, there is a provision which says that uh, criminal measures may be used to enforce IP law, but only if the conduct is willful and if the infringements occur on a commercial scale. Also, if you look at the World Copyright Treaty, it does not refer to any criminal liability in connection with a, a circumvention of technical uh, protection measures. In fact, it allows the circumvention in those cases where you wish to make use of lawful rights that you have in terms of legislation, you know, for example, rights under the fair use uh, provision. And just uh, as an example here on this slide, we see how the attempt in the European Union to introduce criminal measures in 2006 actually failed. So uh, the EU envisaged that there be a uh, a criminal sanctions for all intentional infringements of an intellectual property right on a commercial scale. And uh, the European Parliament rejected this saying that uh, th there must be a specific provision making sure that there will not be criminal liability for any private uses for personal and uh, not for profit purposes. And it is also important to understand that when we say that uh, there may only be liability when there is infringement on a commercial scale, then commercial scale really refers to a commercial scale of a market relevant magnitude. So this means that if uh, you uh, make devices that can be used to circumvent TPM's technical protection measures, then if these are used by 100 or 200 or 300 people and even cause economic damage, then this is not a damage of a commercial scale, uh, assuming market relevant magnitudes. So uh, Sanya, then the last slide, which um, basically summarizes our uh, position, uh, sections 7, uh, 27, 5B and 280 be replaced by civil liability uh, provisions, preferably if parliament really wants to stick to uh, criminal sanctions, then very uh, clearly, um, uh, make sure that only for willful conduct on a commercial scale of a market relevant magnitude. Uh, thank you, honorable members of uh, the committee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prof. 
for the, uh, the presentation uh, uh, together with Sanya. Uh, we, we know that members are experiencing load shedding. Uh, uh, as it has been indicated by Honorable uh, Matebula. Uh, <clears throat> just to check from members whether there are any clarity scheme questions that they would want to, to pose uh, to the uh, presentation from uh, the Coalition of uh, Cited Universities, as uh, led by uh, Dr. Sanya and also Professor. Yeah. Honorable members, I guess uh, I guess uh, your presentation was quite was quite uh, a succinct, uh, prof, and well understood. Uh, <clears throat> maybe just one, just one from my side. <clears throat> the the. Uh, the fair deal, the fair deal, and fair use. Uh, you you raise a point that uh, uh, there is not a major difference between uh, uh, the uh, copyright uh, amendment bill as captured in the copyright amendment bill, uh, and also the the US. Uh, what 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 do you say with regard to the view that suggests that? Uh, countries that we have uh, a history with are not uh, uh, using uh, a fair use, but fair dealing. Yes, yes, uh, that is what I, what I said. Um, you will notice, for example, that um, the UK, you know, South African uh, copyright law was very much oriented at um, English law, but also if you look at European Union law, they envisage systems of uh, fair dealing. And in order to cater now for cases of text and data mining, both these systems had to amend their law to make provision for that. If you have a fair use provision like the uh, US or hopefully South Africa soon, then cases such as text and data mining might be covered by uh, the fair use provision. It's not 100% sure that they uh, would be, that there are perhaps differences of, of opinion, but much more likely to be covered than if you're just working with fair dealing uh, provisions. And that is the, the reason why we said rather include it expressly to make sure it is there, because we know how important it is. Uh, we have seen in the COVID uh, a crisis, how important uh, research and the, you know, the search of vast amounts of information is necessary to come up with solutions. And um, without such a provision, such searches might potentially infringe copyright. So that is the difference. The difference does not really concern the fairness inquiry. And um, the fair use provision in a sense is just another version of the three-step test itself. If you look at uh, the treatise by Martin Senftleben, who wrote like a, a monumental work on the three-step uh, test, there he says that the fair use test, in a sense, is just uh, you know another way of expressing the three-step test, um, just with the advantage that if you've got a fair use provision, you might look at those jurisdictions that work with fair use to see how they're dealing with it, not to say that you must necessarily adopt what they are doing, but at least you've got, a, a, you know, a, um, a, a, a body of, of knowledge available, whereas working with a three-step test is like really working uh, with um, a few sentences, and that is all you have. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, if I may also add a response to that. Yes, yes, uh, Sonia. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. So I just want to draw your attention to uh, the CAB, specifically Section 12A, Subsection B. Um, Section 12A, Subsection B, specifically lists the factors that must be taken into account when filling out the content of fair use. So, for example, if one were to add in future an additional use that's not listed, under 12A subsection A, then the following factors in 12A subsection B 
must be taken into account. For example, the nature of the work, the amount and substantiality of the part of the work that's affected in relation to the whole work, the purpose of the use, the character of the use, whether the use serves a different purpose from the original work, whether that purpose is of a commercial nature or if it's of a non-profit nature. And finally, and probably most importantly, the substitution effect on the market. So if it has a great substitution effect on the market, then it is likely that that use is not going to be considered fair. So just to respond to the anxieties around American style fair use being broad, the South African version of fair use that, that the cab adopts is a hybrid version. So it has specific factors that are enshrined in legislation to prevent any sort of overbroad inclusion or to prevent any sort of effect on the market. I'll stop there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sanya. Just in terms of the, uh, because when you started, uh, you put more emphasis in terms of uh, the, the the rise in the bill of the, the rise in the bill of uh, rights, uh, uh, and particularly uh, the implications of the of the latest concord judgment. But the question that I want to pose, uh, particularly with regard to the concern that has been raised around the the arbitrary nature uh, of the of, of, of the of the two bills, uh, particularly uh, its impact in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the rights protected by the uh, by uh, but uh, the rights protected to the authors, uh, given, 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 given the the nature of a constitution like the the uh, supremacy of the constitution, given the fact that uh, uh, any any act uh, administrative act uh, or a decision taken by government, whether uh, in relation to to the effect that that will have on the the copyright holder, uh, can we take comfort in the fact that any decision that has to be taken by government uh, it has to be rational, uh, and therefore the concern around uh, 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 section twenty five one, which uh, which relates to the uh, protection of the uh, of property because copyright by its nature is an intellectual is an integral part of the intellectual property uh, are you of the view that uh, there is sufficient uh, built in mechanism in our constitution to be able to 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 to, to uh, allay our fears thank you chair uh, i will respond and then i will see if klaus has also an additional response mm -hmm. so section 251 specifically uh, has been interpreted by courts as a right against arbitrary deprivation of property and so the specific test there is uh, there's a seven step test that the fnb judgment in the constitutional court developed now if we apply each of those legs of the test we can see that the first question is to determine whether the interests in uh, at stake uh, actually do constitute a form of constitutionally protected property. Now that question has been left open with regard to copyright, but let's assume even if it is, then we move on to the arbitrary, we move on to checking whether there has been a deprivation of uh, uh, any incidence of ownership uh, or enjoyment of that particular uh, uh, property by the owner of the property. Uh, and let's even assume that, let's assume that there's been some degree of deprivation uh, without conceding. Uh, then the test is an arbitrariness test. Now the Constitutional Court has developed this arbitrariness test in quite a lot of detail. And there are many different steps that must be undertaken to prove that something was indeed an arbitrary deprivation. Now, one of those tests is the test of sufficient reason. And the Concord has described in that test of sufficient reason in its jurisprudence over the years that where a particular um, where, where a particular deprivation serves to give effect to a right in the Bill of Rights, it is very unlikely for it to be held to be arbitrary in the first place, because there's already sufficient reason that can be demonstrated. Um, there's quite a long analysis that can be done on this, but I'll stop there for now.
Uh, and I would just like to highlight that there are several rights that I highlighted that we have highlighted in our written submissions and I can list them as well. So with regard to artists and creators, it's their right to a decent standard of living that is protected by the cab. Uh, it is a right to live and work, a right to their livelihood. Uh, and particularly in the South African constitution, it is a right to choose their profession and trade under section 22 of the constitution that is being promoted by the cab. Uh, with regard to people with disabilities, uh, it is their right uh, against discrimination. It is their right to equality, right to dignity, uh, right to access cultural life and the right to access language. Um, it is also the right to access education. And that also applies to students. It applies to people like Klaus and me as academics also uh, in terms of our right uh, to impart education as well as to receive education, including lifelong education. Um, and there are several others, for example, uh, the right to education is also protected by the cultural heritage protections in the cab, particularly because it ensures that libraries are able to better protect their collections. And we know that all of us access books largely through libraries. Um, again, I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer further questions. And I yield again to Klaus if you have any further responses to the question posed by the chair. Uh, thank you, Sonia. You you answered well, and I, I actually see our time is actually also over. Don't want to, you know, uh, rob the time of of subsequent uh, speakers. Um, perhaps just one one last word to always remember. Always also, if it concerns the protection of property, although this provision, of course, is very important in the constitution. Uh, also, not for, forget to look at uh, what international law says. Um, the international covenant on, you know, the international covenants on human rights actually do not include a provision on the protection of uh, the right to property is, is important um, to note. And another consideration uh, is that uh, all human rights ultimately have a basis in human dignity. So the, the central criterion always is to ask if we protect property, this or that property, to what extent is that necessary to protect human dignity? And to what extent is it actually not really necessary? Uh, to that extent, the protection of property becomes a matter not really so much in my view of the constitution, but of uh, the rest of the legal order. And this is important for constitutionally weighing the importance of interests, you know, access to knowledge, uh, education, science uh, versus uh, the property interests of others. And, uh, and perhaps also last point, um, not to open another can of worms, but important uh, way of protecting the interests of authors and creators, which is very essential because that is, is a human right also in terms of international law. Uh, a strategic instrument is the use of contract law, contract law uh, between in the sphere of copyright uh, between publishers and authors, and we should not neglect that point. That is the point uh, where authors and creators make their money, not subsequently uh, losing perhaps a market um, by others just using perhaps a bit or a bit of too much information or a bit too less uh, thank you thank you thank you thank you prof and thank you dr Sanya, uh, for the uh, uh, presentation and also uh, a word of gratitude on behalf of the select committee uh, for honoring our invite uh, to uh, make an input to this process, which is quite critical. And have a wonderful day. It's thank been our pleasure. Much, it's been our pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanya. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, honorable members, uh, we will now move to the next uh, uh, presenter, which will be. Uh, uh, it will be Ms. Crystal uh, Buchholz Katin. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Crystal. Hi. How are you? Fine, thanks, and you? I'm good. Great. The, I'm floor, not, I'm not the sure. floor is yours. Great, thank you. I just want to make sure I can't see myself. So you can see me, is that correct? Yes, we can see you. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
I don't have a full list of everyone in attendance. So if I do miss uh, somebody, I'll maybe just make a, a, a global um, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on to all the honorable, honorable members. Um, and yeah, uh, pleasure to, to uh, submit my, my perspective on, on the amendments. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if my slides are there. It's not important if they aren't. Um, I'll start with just saying who I am. So I'm a, I'm a, a musician. So I represent, um, I guess, the concerns and the, and the views of independent musicians, um, up and coming musicians, maybe even musicians starting out. So that sort of level of, of musicians. I have, I have worked with, um, uh, I guess, recording artists as well. So I've sort of seen a bit of a bit of, of spectrum of the music industry, but um, in my personal capacity, I, I, I write music, I record music, I play music. <laughs> and I've also, um, since lockdown, started making music videos and um, educational content as well. So um, that's kind of the perspective I'm talking from. Um, so yeah, going back to the idea of, of, uh, of lockdown, I think for many, many musicians in my, uh, in my sort of corner, as it were, we found that digital, digital royalties and digital income was very important because our, our livelihood dried up. And, and many musicians that I know took a crash course in uh, learning to do videos, learning what royalties they could access, other ways of making money in music. And as a result, the, this, the, the, I guess where, where the, the copyright law really touches the musicians in terms of this 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 part digital and 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 um, and and royalty income is quite important for musicians I think more than ever and and I think there are a lot of musicians quite concerned about how this will impact them going forward um, so I think content uh, the online space is a is a is a big ocean. And it's very easy for anybody to put up content. Um, as we all know, you can take a cell phone recording and have something go viral in minutes. But um, my, my experience, here we go, thank you. <laughs> we can, uh, can I run the slides? There we go. So that was just an introduction of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, the next slide, sorry. <laughs> that was just so that you have an idea of some of what I've done. Um, and we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this was an interesting one I just wanted to show you. So um, I started doing YouTube videos and I just wanted to make the point that my, my viewership really, uh, really did value the time and effort that I put into making good quality videos, especially the ones that were of educational uh, content. So this one is a, an educational one and it just shows you that um, they trusted me because I put quality content out. They, they, there was a lot of other content available, but because they could see that mine was um, quality and, and that time and thought was put into it as an educational video, they trusted that I was giving them the correct version and, and educational um, constructs that they needed. Okay, we can go to the, the next slide. <laughs> Importance of digital income to the independent artist. So as I was uh, mentioning, um, uh, musicians are are quite uh, concerned about their digital and 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 copyright income streams for uh, as as part of um, as part of their earnings. I think many musicians earn money from various sources, uh, from live performance to um, uh, contract work to to online online and digital and copyright. In income streams. So it is one of the income streams, but as I mentioned, it's a very important one for musicians. Um, just to go into some of the costs from a from a, from a someone who's done it. Um, to to make a three minute song, uh, where, where are my notes here? To make a simple three minute song that you can you can upload in a week's time on Spotify, you are looking at anywhere from a thousand rand to ten thousand rand and up just to produce a song. That would include the recording, any session work, um, getting it onto various platforms. And that is before you've done any marketing on the song. Um, I, it's, it's a point that I think is, is, is often overlooked in, in, a, in a content rich environment. One has to 
market something to to stand out in the crowd so marketing marketing costs can be as little as a dollar a day to um uh, to get something onto an international radio station or even local radio station will cost 7,000 Rand per song. So the input costs for a three minute song are not negligible. And that's before you've made a music video um, and maybe other, other aspects that you want to add to, to this. So I, I would like from, from my own perspective and I think the musicians I've spoken to in this regard, we, we aim to recoup at least our costs from, from our endeavors um, and hopefully make a profit of course um, and we work in a constrained environment in terms of incomes and that would be uh, the, the various platforms like to take Spotify, Deezer, any of those platforms, iTunes, they often pay as little as a fraction of a cent per, per play for, per song so it's not like um, musicians are making a lot of money per play on a, on a song so in recouping the costs of a song takes a very long time and one has to spend a lot of money in terms of marketing to recoup any any costs um all right let's maybe perhaps move on to sorry i lost my place <laughs> um oh that's also another point i wanted to make recouping the uh, royalties or um digital online earnings can take a long time um often the reporting so i i work through a a a, a content a, what they call a DSP, a digital service provider based in the state. And they have to wait for all the various um, online platforms to submit their data. And then once they've submitted their data, which is sometimes months, months late, um, and I get told where my song has been played and how much I've earned, and then I can get get the money there from. So the, the cash flow is not exactly, <laughs> it's not like my song was played and then I've got money in my account the next day. Um, um, so let's move on to, uh, uh, sorry, no, sorry, can we go back a little bit? <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much. The idea of control, the artist control. So um, some of the works, I, I, I play classical violin as, as part of my uh, online persona. And some of these videos were made as um, educational for people. And um, so here I'm starting to allude to the idea, the idea of, of fair use and um, perhaps how it could be extended or not extended or how, it, how I understand it to be used. And I'm open to questioning or, or to, um, to hear what your views are. Um, making, th making educational content available is fairly easy on online platforms. So what I had done, is I'd made um, videos, separate videos available for free uh, to, to members who wanted to submit a, an, an email or take a survey for that content. And I've seen that many other um, online creators do something similar. So there's, there's, there's a lot of free content actually available, very good free, free content available. Um, often often to, to make it viable for the creator, they have some content available behind a paywall. Obviously, they've got to recoup their costs, and they 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 can deem that um, as necessary for them to to make make their costs back. But just to say that um, educational content is 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 uh, what's the word is easy to make freely available to people. And and I think what I'm kind of driving at is that the artist. I think many people in my position feel that the artist should have some control in how that is how that is made available, and and many are open to making that available. Um, they just want to be able to control it, or perhaps have a mechanism like, can you take a survey, or can you give me an email address, or something along those lines. So um, uh, that's the one aspect of of taking control. Um, I guess also in that regard, it's um, the, the 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 creator of the content also has has the choice in what they choose to monetize and what they choose not to monetize. Um, I've also seen content creators who have um, work that's behind a paywall, but they will make a portion of it available for free in a very casual manner, so it was easy for them to make. Maybe it's on their cell phone, and they'll put it out to people on their mailing list. So, yeah, I think. 
I'm, I, I'm not sure I was, I, I caught the tail end of the previous, uh, previous discussion. And I think, I, you know, access to information, I do get that there are some challenges and there is a digital divide, but for those who have access to, to online platforms, you know, there is a vast amount of um, information available freely to, to many people. Um, then, then there's the aspect in terms of control of permission to how a work is used. So um, I guess I've dealt with sort of monetization and now to deal with um, how, how it is used. So I think there's also the concern amongst some creators that their, their work may be used in a context that doesn't support their, their views, their values, their context. It could be taken, you know, they could be aligned with a, a cause that they perhaps don't support through, through the introduction of fair use. And um, I, I think artists would like to, again, have control of how their, their work is used. And, and, and I guess uh, many would like to just have the opportunity to to have their consent, I think, given. I think that that's, it feels, it feels like the artist's consent has been eroded and taken away by, by the fair use clause. Um, uh, just a note on that, personally, I've had, to, I've had to request permission to use content and vice versa, I've had someone request permission from myself. Also very easy in, a, in an age of social media platforms and, um, uh, websites it's very easy to find a publisher or somebody that you that you can request permission from so um I, I just yeah I just it just kind of feels like consent should be something that is is uh is still kept and and that both parties can reasonably request permission for how a work is used and if an artist disagrees especially if it is contrary to how they want to be perceived as an artist or their work, um, there should be some space for them to have, have that view recognized. Um, all right, then we can move on to the next slide, which is the burdens of the amendments. So um, the first one I wanted to speak about is, is um, as I understand the, the introduction of fair use, there is the three-step test that they, or, 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 a, or a, a test of how, how a, a work is used. Um, but it's not like, as I understand it, it's not that consent has been requested from the artist. So what that would do is it places an, a, a burden in terms of the artist trying to find where their, their works are being used and how. So currently, artists know, have an, have an idea of a certain, a certain in, in terms of fair dealing, how much of their work is possibly being used in terms of education um, or criticism and those those kinds of avenues but if I as I understand it in terms of some of the uh, uh, readings that I've done it would it would make it the onus put the onus on the artist to to find places where the, the work is used both in an online and an offline setting and then to evaluate if their work has been used fairly or unfairly um, and this this is a huge task. Um, many artists have, you know, for, for, for one song, it would be a, a great undertaking to have a body of work out there. You would spend just, I mean, it's just impossible to find all the places that your song could be a, der a derivative of or used in. And as a, um, I guess, a, a smaller operator, as a musician, it's just a, a time constraint that we, we cannot take on. And then similar to that, um, if you do find that your work has been used in a, in a setting, I, I understand it that the artist would then, or the creator would then, um, the onus would be on the creator to take the matter to, to court to evaluate whether the instance has been fairly used or not. And I feel that that would really um, be disadvantageous to creatives because they're not, uh, they, they don't have, budget for legal legal fees of this nature and and again if you have one or two or three works out there with multiple multiple uses in other settings that you haven't um, consented to this this really could add up and I think many artists would just um, just just really couldn't couldn't support such a such an endeavor so I'm not sure if there's a provision in in some way that artists 
would be able to um, evaluate how their work is used without having to go to the courts because it's it's really it really would be daunting and expensive for many many artists. All right. Um, All uh, right, uh, I think, okay, then we can move on to the next slide. So I, in addition um, to the reading that I did, I, I did go speak to somebody who is first in, in legal matters and, and they gave me some points that I, I could mention. Um, so here we go. Uh, the point is that we do not have a system of punitive damages as the US does. There is therefore no disincentive to stop any parties from claiming fair use as there is in the US. So that is my point as to who gets to claim to use your work in what setting. Um, another point they made was that the US has thousands of cases of fair use because that is what it is, a judge made law. Um, thousands of court cases would, would be generated and lawyers would make the money and the artists would be, would be uh, disincentivized and um, prejudiced. Um, so this is now just coming from the legal person that I spoke to. I'm not sure of the section of the copyright myself, but their point was that the proponents of fair use claim that it is necessary to future-proof our law in respect of rapidly changing technology. Yet our current section 13 of Copyright Act enables the minister to pass, pass regulations to do just that. Um, Right, and then I'm happy to move on to the conclusion, which is the next slide. Thank you. So in, in conclusion, I think many, many um, creatives and artists, up and coming small operators, hopefuls, <laughs> people wanting to go into music, welcome an update in terms of technology and a copyright law that would fit in with the modern modern world. Uh, however, there are concerns as to what it will do to their creative rights and, and I think the motivations for them to create, to, to continue to create material. Um, I think artists want to would like to continue some control over how their works are used and monetized. I think artists that would, would like to um, have protection in terms of copyright of their works and um, would not want to have to um, have to go to court to defend their works unnecessarily. Um, and um, I wasn't quite sure, I think, like I said, I caught the tail end of the previous talk, but I, I did hear um, the gentleman mention um, uh, something, something to do with um, if, if too much or too little has been used of a certain work that, that is sort of more negligible. And I think from the perspective of a, a smaller operator, someone who's not signed to a record label, a small bit here or there really could add up in terms of, uh, you know, a musician making, making their career slowly. So I do think that needs to be borne in mind. Not all, not all musicians are signed to record labels who, who maybe have budget to take on um, law, law cases. So I think, yeah, speaking for the, the, the smaller artist, I'd like to say that, um, you know, if 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 an artist could could actually earn 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 more, and they're not because of it's deemed a little, it's not deemed as uh, it's deemed as negligible, then you know, actually that uh, that artist is just is um, prejudiced. All right, I hope I've <laughs> fairly uh, represented my my views to to you, and I welcome any any questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Christel uh, for the, uh, the manner in which we have uh, uh, responded to our call uh, to canvas uh, your views. Uh, uh, for now, we don't have any views. We are we are in a in a process of uh, canvassing views from the public, uh, which uh, definitely. Uh, at, at the right time, we'll then, as a committee, having exhausted all the the uh, committee, I mean, uh, all the uh, views as expressed by those that indicated, and 
that responded positive to our call, we will then be able to, to have a reflection as a committee uh, and then, uh, uh, then uh, allow also the, <clears throat> the, uh, the process uh, to go to, to the house uh, and then uh, uh, the, the, the views of the house then will then be maybe uh, the final one, which will then be then uh, seconded to the president either to sign or he might decide to do what he has done with the previous uh, uh, bill, send it back. <laughs> but I think we, 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 we value your views from, uh, from uh, your position. Uh, it was quite, it was quite uh, categoric. Let me just check from other members as to whether do they have any, any views that they want to converse with you. Uh, it looks like members are quite happy with your with your inputs. Let me then, on behalf of the uh, members, take this opportunity to express a word of gratitude to uh, the manner in which we are able to express uh, the views uh, of an independent uh, uh, artist up and coming, as you have probably pointed out, quite fascinating <laughs> and exciting. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next presenter, the next presenter will be uh, the uh, presentation from Mr. Ben Kirshden. I guess he's the chairperson of the Red Create uh, South Africa. Over to you, Mr. Ben, Kashdan. Chairperson, unfortunately, I do not see Mr. Kashdan on the platform. Um, oh. I have sent the organization and um, I have tried to contact the organization just to establish where they are because we have not received this presentation yet either. <clears throat> the, the, pre the presenter the after is the Western Cape Provincial Department of Economic Development. Um, they, that individual um, was connected earlier on, but I think maybe due to, to load shedding, he has disconnected. But I've just been following up with him just to find out if he can't maybe start a little bit earlier um, in the absence of Mr. Cashton. Okay. Uh, the Western Cape government, uh, which uh, I see is Mr. Benson and um, Kunu and Ms. Michelle Ellis. You said uh, they were on the platform and then uh, they disappeared. Yes, yes, and I don't see them on the platform now, Chi. Um, so okay. I'm just following up with them just to find out where they are because we have okay. asked that all presenters be um, in the meeting at least one hour before the start of the session. So they okay. should be um, in on the platform already. Um, but then we just follow up with them. Um, apologies for the delay. Okay, good, great.
Are we succeeding? Chairperson, I'm unfortunately I am not able to get a hold of anybody. Um, I'm still trying to um, contact the second numbers that we have. Just can you just please um, can we can I maybe propose that we take a ten minute break just that can, just so that we can resolve this chair? Um, because I'm struggling to get a hold of the people who are supposed to be on the platform. All right, it's fine. Let's let's let's, let's then have a, a ten minutes break and then resume after ten minutes. Thank you.
minor technical issues here. Um, trying to fix them now very quickly. I don't know if you, I can see myself, so I think you guys can see me. Yes, we can see you. Can, can I just ask you, if, um, Maria, if you're still there, if you're able to flight the presentation on your side? I'm having some okay. issues with sharing. Is that okay? Okay. Um, um, I would ask Enrico if you can please flight the presentation on behalf of Ms. Mimpo Perfect, perfect, perfect. Over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. Next slide, uh, Enrico. Yeah, uh, good morning, Chairperson, honorable members, colleagues, and members of the public. My name is Benson Kunu, and I was responsible for compiling the submission on the Copyright Amendment Bill on behalf of the uh, Western, Cape's, uh, Western Cape Government's Department of Economic Development and Tourism, um, which was the lead department on this particular bill. Um, so the bill was developed over a number of years uh, to bring alignment between South Africa's copyright law, uh, the transition to the digital era, as well as developments at a multilateral level. Uh, what we see as a long overdue and necessary amendment of the Act will allow South Africa to comply with uh, international treaties and conventions, which require the country's domestic legislation to be consistent with uh, international imperatives. Beyond this, uh, there are a number of competing considerations which require heeding, chief amongst which is, you know, having intellectual property legislation that is cognizant of the need to improve access to key information and learning resources. Um, in light of South Africa's social and economic circumstances within an ever evolving digital era, whilst also ensuring that you know, creators and their livelihoods are sufficiently protected from commercial exploitation. Uh, last week, I was able to attend um, the public hearings organized by the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. I think my main takeaway from that one meeting is, as if I wasn't already aware of this, uh, but my main takeaway was just how polarizing the bill is. Um, I think before even beginning to unpack our submission as a province, it's important to acknowledge that tension um, or the tension that exists between you know, the economic interests of major corporations locally and globally, uh, whose investment into South Africa can't be overlooked. Um, and those of you know, vulnerable artists who've, you know, who've drawn the short stick historically, um, having been exploited by a multitude of actors. It's also important to acknowledge the vital social outcomes uh, which the current version of the bill seeks to enable uh, with proponents of fair and just access to learning resources lauding the bill as the solution to you know historical barriers to education so you know before proceeding with outlining our comments i think it's just important for us to you know remain constantly aware of that tension um, and being aware of you know, how incredibly difficult it is to you know get it right uh, with a bill of this nature that being said um, i'll be providing the committee with a brief on our submission um, on the bill, um, it's important to note, you know, from the outset that as, as a department responsible for economic development, uh, while we took into consideration a number of different factors in drafting our comments, uh, we primarily viewed or reviewed the bill from the perspective of its impact on the economy. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the predominant concerns, um, you know, which has loomed large throughout the, the development of the bill has been the lack of a publicly available regulatory impact, um, regulatory or, or socioeconomic impact assessment. As a provincial government, we, you know, we've required regulatory impact assessments or REARs to be performed in respect of any substantial changes in law and or policy. Um, and it's been practiced that the same is required by national government in the form of socioeconomic impact assessments known as SEARs. Um, the differences between the two are only technical in nature. However, they both provide you know, a similar evidentiary burden requiring an assessment of impact to be undertaken with potential unintended consequences considered. It does not appear that this was done in respect of any recent version of this bill. Um, and if it was, uh, these assessments haven't been made, you know, publicly available, uh, which, you know, would de defeat the purpose altogether. Um, I understand the Publish Publishers Association of South Africa, PASA, uh, raised these concerns in 2022, um, noting in particular the bill's perceived um, unconstitutionality and non-compliance with international treaties. PASA, uh, together with other professional and industry associations, made numerous attempts to demonstrate the, um, the impact of the bill, 
um, on the industry as well as the broader South African economy. Uh, while a SIA report was compiled in 2017, um, that document didn't appear to have any proper or properly compiled, have been com properly compiled under the SIA's guidelines, um, failing to outline a clear assessment of economic impacts um, that the bill will or might have on the different strata of stakeholders uh, within South Africa. PASA accordingly commissioned uh, PwC to undertake a study on the key provisions of the bill. Uh, the overall conclusion drawn from the study is that you know, the bill will have substantial impacts on the South African economy. Um, my, apologies, South African publishing. my apologies, Benson. Uh, I think you must, uh, as you move uh, forward, you must ask uh, Enrico to, to move with you. To move. Yes. Right. No problem. I will do that, Jay. Yeah. Um, are we, yeah, I'm on the PASA, the PASA slide, Enrico. Perfect. Um, as I was saying, Chair, um, a study was commissioned um, by PASA, uh, commissioned to PwC, um, and they undertook a study on the key provisions of the bill where, you know, the main conclusions to be drawn from the study was that the bill will have substantial impacts on the publishing, uh, publishing industry, with PwC estimating that the bill will lead to a 33% reduction in book sales, and that the domestic publishing industry would lose 30% of its jobs. Uh, next slide, Enrico. Well, it's vital that the, you know, the current act be substantially revised uh, to align with South Africa's international obligations. The above findings from the PwC study highlight the importance of some form of economic impact assessment, be it in the form of a REA like we do in the Western Cape or a SIA that, you know, that's, that's, that's done nationally at national government level um, to ascertain the unintended consequences of introducing the bill in its current form. Uh, we submit that you know there appears little point in pursuing legislation that seeks to offer you know vital social outcomes um, but at the cost of economic expediency um, with the la with the latter obviously having a direct correlation uh, to the social outcomes being sought next slide enrico um, i will now be moving to our you know our comments on the more specific clauses contained within the bill so the first clause um which has been one of the most contentious is clause 15, uh, which inserts a number of provisions starting with um, starting with proposed section 12A, which provides for general exceptions from copyright protection. Uh, the proposed section uh, reduces the, cop the, the protection that a copyright owner has over his or her copyright. The upshot, the upshot of the proposed section 12A um, is that copyright owners will no longer be able to be remunerated for their work when it is used for purposes such as those contemplated in paragraphs A1 to 7. Um, further, uh, the wording has been amended, broadening the scope of the purposes for which a work may be legitimately used. The current section 12, one of the act provides for a closed list of, of purposes, while the proposed section 12A1 refers to purposes such as the following, uh, with the use of such as, uh, suggesting that this is a more open list, which is likely to lead to copyright owners not being able to, or not being remunerated where their work is used for purposes similar to those listed. Uh, we accordingly submit you know, as a province that the proposed section 12A substantially limits the copyright owner's right to enjoyment of his or her property, uh, which amounts to arbitrary deprivation of property as uh, contemplated in section 25.1 of the South African constitution. You know, we saw in the South African diamond case, um, you know, which was heard in the concourt, it was held that in order for there to be an infringement of section 12 one, which deals with the right to uh, right to property. Um, firstly, the right or the question or the thing in question must be property. Um, and we know from the Laughed Off Promotions case also in the concourt that intellectual property has been recognized as a constitutionally protectable property. Uh, secondly, there must be deprivation, which is substantial, i.e. the intrusion must be so extensive as to have a legally significant impact on the rights of the affected party. And then finally, the deprivation must be arbitrary, um, i.e. the deprivation or the depriving law does not provide sufficient reason for the deprivation or the depriving law is procedurally unfair. The purpose, you know, the purpose of the proposed legislation is presumably uh, to provide access to copyright material without having to obtain the copyright owner's permission. However, the open list is far too wide and the circumstances in which copyright works can be used in terms of this provision are imprecise, um, which are likely to lead to quite a great, you know, quite a, quite a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the purpose of enhancing access to copyright material is not justified by the extent of the provision. 
um, with the effect of weakening the overall copyright protection that a copyright owner enjoys or is supposed to enjoy. Next slide, please, Enrico. Uh, still on clause 15, uh, we submit that proposed section 12A contravenes section 22 of the constitution, which provide for, provides for citizens' right to choose their trade, occupation, or profession freely. In the same SA Diamond Producers case, uh, the Concord held that if a legislative provision has a negative impact on the choice of trade, occupation, or profession, then the provision must be reasonable and justifiable in terms of the criterion listed in the limitations clause under section 36 of the constitution. If a legislative provision pro, um, makes the practice of a trade or profession so undesirable, difficult, or unprofitable um, that the choice to enter that trade or profession is limited, then section 22 of the constitution is contravened. Um, we accordingly submit that, you know, proposed section 12A contravenes section 22 and that its provisions are so onerous as to render the occupations of anyone who produces a work contemplated in the proposed section and who deals in, cop in copyright uh, to be undesirable, difficult, un or unprofitable. Uh, the provisions may unduly impinge um, a copyright owner's ability to make a living and thereby negatively affect the choice to pursue that occupation. Further, uh, proposed section 12A violates section 22 of the constitution because there's no apparent justification or rational reason um, for the provisions and due to there being no available impact assessment, which I mentioned earlier, or I mentioned the importance of earlier, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to rely on any of the rights, uh, of the, limitations, the limitations of rights that are outlined in the in section 36 one of the constitution. So we see, you know, ultimately we submit that section 12A is, is, un, is unconstitutional. Next slide, Enrico. Proposed section 12D. Um, this provides for exceptions from copyright protection applicable to uh, reproduction or educational or for education and academic activities. Um, the exception from copyright protection is in education and academic activities also results in copyright owners being afforded far less protection, uh, consequently limiting their right to benefit from their work. It's, we submit that you know, this amounts to a deprivation of property, which is again, um, arbitrary as contemplated under you know, section 25.1. Um, for example, so I think the main issue is that um, there's, there's not a lot of clarity as far as what, um, sorry, I, I think I just lost my place here. Um, you know, the purpose of the provision is quite, you know, quite importantly to, you know, promote access to copyright material for educational purposes. Um, but, you know, the provision is so, so broad, um, or it's, it's way too broad and it's likely to lead to, you know, it's, it's going to increase the likelihood, the way we see it, of, of being exploited. Um, outside of the maybe the perceived ambit of what the drafters may have intended. For example, the provision permits the copying of entire books or journals if the license to do so is not available from the copyright owner, collecting society or an indigenous community on reasonable terms and conditions, um, where the book cannot be obtained at a price reasonably related to that normally charged in South Africa for comparable works. Um, it's not, you know, it's not defined in the actual bill what constitutes a reasonable price or reasonable terms, which again, is, you know, it gives grounds for uncertainty and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult to enforce essentially. You know, these provisions can be interpreted very broadly and thus exploited. Um, and it's, it's ultimately our submission that the extent of the deprivation is not justified by the purpose of granting access to works um, for educational purposes and is therefore arbitrary and unconstitutional. Uh, next slide, next slide, Enrico. Thank you. Moving to clause 22. Um, which provides for the insertion of uh, proposed section 19C, providing for general exceptions from copyright, uh, copyright protection, specifically in respect of copyright work for libraries, archives, museums, and galleries. Uh, it's submitted that the exceptions regarding protection of copyright work for libraries, archives, museums, and galleries also constitute arbitrary dep uh, deprivation of property um, as contemplated under section 25.1. Uh, proposed section 19C3 provides for library, archive, museum, and gallery to provide temporary access uh, to a copyright work to a user or another library. Um, it's not clear what is meant by the word access. Um, proposed section 19C9 uh, permits a library, archive, museum, and gallery to make a copy of a copyright work for its own collection when the permission of the copyright owner after a reasonable endeavor uh, cannot be obtained or when the work is not available by general trade or from the publisher, uh, publisher themselves. 
it's not clear again, you know, from the wording, um, what reasonable endeavor actually means, uh, what it means to, you know, up, up, yeah, what it means to, up, to make reasonable endeavor to, to obtain permission. Uh, does this mean that a reasonable endeavor was made to obtain permission when the copyright owner expressly forbade the copying of the work? Is that a reasonable endeavor? Or does it mean that a reasonable endeavor was made to locate the copyright owner, whether or not it, it, it was successful or, or not? Ultimately, it's submitted that these provisions constitute a substantial loss of prof uh, uh, profit uh, for copyright owners. Uh, furthermore, uh, they are far too broad and vague um, to support the purposes contemplated in the provisions and the deprivation of the copyright owner's property is therefore, again, arbitrary. Um, many of the other issues, Chair, are, Chair and the committee, many of the other issues were you know, of a more technical, um, technical nature, um, you know, relating to language, drafting convention, et cetera. So I don't think it's necessary for me to take the committee through any of those. Um, that said, I just, um, I wanted to, you know, summarize very quickly what we put forward as the main issues, um, our main issues with this bill. Next slide, Enrico. Um, the, three, the three main issues that we have, uh, the first being is the insertion of proposed sections 12A, 12D, and 19C of the bill, which we see as substantially limiting a copyright owner's right to enjoyment of his or her property, amounting to arbitrary deprivation of property as contemplated under section 25.1 of the constitution. Secondly, um, we, we submit that, you know, section 22 of the constitution, which states that every citizen has, you know, the right to choose their trade, occupation, or profession freely, and that the practice of a trade, occupation, or profession is violated by section 12A, or the insertion of proposed section 12A. And finally, I mean, this is an almost catch-all issue. Um, I cannot emphasize enough just how, you know, the lack of a proper comprehensive socioeconomic impact assessment will impinge on the legitimacy of this bill. Um, as I said right at the beginning, um, uh, Chair and Committee, uh, there are many competing interests at stake here. Uh, to avoid a bill that's passed on sentiment or not, you know, a bill that's not, you know, practical or practicable, um, and that, that is lacking in, 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 you know, the ability to enforce or enforceability, any decision, you know, any decision on how the bill proceeds needs to be based on, you know, evidence, um, which can be found, you know, which can really only be uh, gathered through a comprehensive socioeconomic impact assessment um, that would look at how the bill will impact on different segments of society with a proper analysis of costs and benefits of the country as a whole. So it would allow us to almost, you know, weigh up the different interests involved and see what the, what the, what the best position is and what the least restrictive outcomes will be um, for the country and obviously what the benefits that might accrue as well are. I think I can end it off. Um, I'm happy to include on that point, Chair. Uh, thank you to you and the rest of the committee for listening. Thank you, uh, Benson, for the for the uh, presentation on behalf of the Sinki government. Uh, let me uh, ascertain from members as to whether is there any is there any uh, in question that they would want to pose to to you, Ben. Uh, <clears throat> It looks like it looks like uh, it looks like as it is of now, uh, quite uh, audible uh, and quite understood uh, uh, by raising uh, <clears throat> the, the the competing interests that are at the center of the bill uh, during your 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 your, your conversation. Uh, the uh, the arbitrary nature. That is the point that you raise the lack of socioeconomic uh, uh, impact assessment, and also the uh, <clears throat> the uh, violation of uh, of section twenty two of the constitution. Those are the the thrust of the issues that you have raised. Uh, just just one question from my side: uh, the the latest concord judgment. Uh, uh, that was brought by the blind South Africa, uh, which uh, indicated that there is a, the, the, the current act is, uh, is as constitutional so far as it does not accommodate uh, mm. the, the, their interest. So I'll see of you with regard to that. Um, I think, I think, so I think you'll struggle, Chair, to find anyone who might directly be, in, uh, be affected by whether the bill is passed or not. 
whether they are on one side of the spectrum um, or, the, or on the other. I think everyone can agree that the current act needs to be amended. It's, it's been a pressing need for a number of years now. Uh, so whether you are on one side of the spectrum as an artist or as a major corporation broadcasting or record label or an activist in the education sector, I think everyone can agree on the fact that the current act, mm -hmm. there needs to be alignment between the current act and what, what changes have occurred you know, with the digital era. And obviously, like I said in the beginning of the presentation share, um, South Africa's international and ongoing international commitments. I think the only issue, Chair, is that um, there needs to be some kind of balance in terms of what the impact of the current bill will have and the extent of impact, actually. Um, so, like I said, I think it'll be very difficult to keep everyone happy. Um, and that's why I almost wanted to be the committee's, if I, if I could choose one point in my presentation that, or our submission as a, as a province, I think we need to undertake a comprehensive impact assessment to determine the impacts firstly, and also to almost weigh up which, um, what course is likelier to, you know, to reap the most benefits for South African society as a whole. So it's one thing to have, you know, to sort of compare or juxtapose economic interests versus social outcomes, but the two are interlinked. Um, so you can't have, in my opinion, you can't have the social outcomes that we're looking to have or looking to produce with the bill if it comes at the cost of, you know, being able to attract, you know, investment into the country and having and having a growing film sector, for example, with, you know, with, with companies like, you know, I'm not going to mention any names, but there's, there's, country, there's companies, major international um, streaming sites that are investing into the country. And that, you know, the idea is that, you know, if we're able to grow that base, then everyone is able to benefit, you know, to some extent. Um, so it's about striking that balance between protecting and also creating an enabling environment, which is what our main, I think, I think thrust should be. And I think the only way, Chair, for us to be able to do that is to have an assessment of what the actual impacts are going to be on the economy and society as a whole. Um, so as we continue to almost, you know, go through the different phases of analyzing the provisions of, of the current bill, we need to almost be cognizant at every stage of, of development that, you know, who are we actually, what's, what's the ultimate, what's the outcome that we're trying to produce here? You know, and that's where the unintended consequences consequences come in as well, because you might have one outcome in mind, but the provision actually ends up producing a completely different outcome. Um, so you, you know, the the impact assessment that I speak that I speak about, or that I mentioned, allows us to at least map out what those potential un unintended consequences might be, and to make an informed decision before we proceed with, um, with whatever version of 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 the bill or the provisions that are in the bill as as they are now. No, thank, thank, thanks, Benson. I'm, uh, Mr. Benson Kuno from, uh, on behalf of the Western Cape Provincial Government uh, for, for, for that presentation. I believe that uh, members uh, are comfortable and, and we're quite clear in terms of uh, your views. And let me, on behalf of the Select Committee, express a word of gratitude to you for the effort that you took in terms of responding to our invite and also enriching this process. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much, Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. Your afternoon. Bye. Chief, Thank you. Chief, Chief Person. Hello, Madia. Hi, Chi. Hi, Chi. Um, we've um, finally managed to get a hold of Rikri Haight, and they've indicated that the person who's supposed to be making the presentation's flight was delayed, which is why um, they were not ready. Um, they still need to confirm with us because they wanted to know if they could maybe come in later on today. Um, right at the end of the session. But what we have done is that we've asked the following to um, the, the presenters that are to follow multi choice as well as the um, Copyright Coalition of South Africa and the South African Music Rights Organization, if they can also just start the session 30 minutes earlier and they've agreed. So up next will be multi choice. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Maria, for, 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 for that uh, uh, progressive uh, intervention. Uh, let's then uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Anon Doyle and Colin Lamini and Lara Kanto on behalf of the, the multi choice uh, to the floor. The podium is yours. Good morning, Chair. Good morning to Committee members. Chair, am I audible? 
very, very honorable, uh, uh, Mr. Tlamini. We are. We can see you. <laughs> no, thank you, Chair. Um, my, my name is Colin Lamini. I'm the Group Executive for Corporate Affairs at, at Multi Choice Group. Um, Multi Choice and Mnet welcome the opportunity to make the submissions on these bills. I will not hog the stage alone, Chair. I am joined by my colleagues, Tawo Makenete, who is the General Manager for Technical Regulatory Affairs. Lara Kento, the General Manager for Mnet Regulatory, Ainan Doyle, Head of Policy Analysis and Research, and Ms. Wendy Rosenberg, Director of Worksman's Attorneys. Chair, we will share some of the problems in the Copyright Amendment Bill in our presentation today. The urgent need to deal with internet piracy for us to keep up with the digital era, the key issues to be addressed in the performance protection amendment bill. Uh, thereafter, we will then uh, provide our concluding remarks. <clears throat> Just by way of introduction, Chen, to the members, MultiChoice is a proudly South African company which has been around for more than 35 years with a footprint in 50 countries across the African continent. Four years ago, we unbundled from NASPES and we listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. We are now a proud level one BEE company with one of the most successful triple BE schemes, the Putuma Natitia scheme. We employ thousands of South Africans across the film and television industry and the entire value chain. And as a broadcaster with significant investments in film and television production, we are both major investors and users of copyright. Therefore, the copyright framework is of critical importance to us. We agree with the majority of stakeholders, uh, including the previous uh, presenter who just spoke now, is, who all say that South Africa's copyright regime must be updated. We totally agree with that. And we also agree that the bill with the bill's objectives. And it's important to note that broadcasters are operating in an increasingly difficult changing environment. We are facing immense pressure from regulation, international streaming platforms, and piracy, which is on the rise in South Africa. Therefore, it is essential that copyright is used to incentivize and reward creativity. It is clear to us that this bill in its current form is likely to stifle investment in local television production and creativity. We are thankful for the chance to share our experience and highlight all that could be lost if the problems in the bills are not addressed. Now, Chair, for broadcasters, the vast majority of local productions are commissioned and paid for by broadcasters. We put up all the funding up front and we take all the risk. So creating local television content boosts the local film and production industry, and it creates opportunities for many, many role players in the sector, for writers, actors, producers, and numerous support positions. MultiChoice is proud to have developed over 20 proprietary local television channels across 10 markets in Africa. We also have a local audiovisual content library in Africa spanning over 69,000 hours. In 22 alone, MultiChoice produced 6,000 hours of local television content for African markets and invested in excess of 5 billion rand in local general entertainment and sports content. Why? Simply because we believe in our talent, the stories that they want to tell, and the need to take these stories to the world. In 2021 and 2022, we partnered with the Eastern Cape Development Corporation. We filmed two seasons of Survivor South Africa in the Wild Coast during the COVID pandemic. And before Survivor was shot in the Eastern Cape, we normally used to film 
survivor in many beautiful iron islands around the world, like in Fiji, for example. But this time we were deliberate about attracting investment and creating jobs, especially at a provincial level. And we brought the greatest gain in the world to the home soil. As a result, we boosted the local economy by more than 28 million rand. We created 168 jobs for communities with more than 400,000 rand in donations to community organizations. If you can just imagine for a second, in just over 40 days, a young unemployed lady by the name of Yolanda from the Ama Kumube uh, community, she generated an income of over 80,000 rand from catering food to the production crew and the contestants. And her brother Mongezi provided lighting systems and learned new skills from international experts that were on this production. This is only one production, which is an example of how local television content not only entertains audiences, but also brings a range of social and economic benefits to communities. Therefore, there is so much potential in this type of investments, and they could be replicated in other provinces if we have a sound corporate framework. Now, the fundamental question for the committee to consider, in our view, is whether the bills will promote or discourage investment in the creative sector. Unfortunately, in their present form, the bills will discourage investment. Many proposed new rigid and impractical rules will make it much, much harder to get content on air. We will take you through some of our key concerns on how we can fix these bills. Our proposal on how we can move forward on the bills is that the, invest, the interests of investors and creators should not be seen as competing interests. We all want to see a thriving and sustainable local production sector. But to achieve this, we need an enabling legislative environment. In the current form, as I've said, these bills do not provide an enabling environment and will harm those it seeks to protect. Hence, the unintended consequences. We should de-link these two bills. The copyright bill, despite its admirable objectives, has many problems. We have proposed key minimum amendments to address the problematic issues for the copyright amendment bill to progress. The performance protection bill is less problematic and requires a few amendments in specific instances. I will now hand over to my colleague, Ainan, to highlight those specific provisions and take us through those issues. Ainan, over to you. Chairs, honorable members, before moving on to the next slide, and with a focus on the copyright amendment bill, I think it's important to note that the theme of here is the Copyright Act. It is not the Copyright Exceptions Act, nor is it the Copyright Justice Protection Act. It is the Copyright Act. But what my, 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 my apology, uh, I just want to check with members. Am I the only one that is struggling to hear Mr. Aylan? Are you comfortable? Yes, it looks like this, uh, uh, Colin was quite uh, audible enough. Uh, can you again take the floor, uh, Inan? Yes, sir. Can you, can you hear me now? I'm speaking a bit louder. Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Chair. The name of the Act is the Copyright Act. It is not the Copyright Exceptions Act, nor is it the Copyright Users Protection Act. It is the Copyright Act. So what is copyright? It is a legal right established by and enforced by the state to protect the creators of works and the owners of copyright. The primary aim, whether the creator of works or the owner of copyright is a multi-million rand company or an individual give them control over their work and how it is used. And why should the state do so? As Colin mentioned, 
to be honest, because if the economic value derived, when one exploits this legal right, whether you're the greater or third party, businesses are created, jobs are created, the different the local, the regional, and the national economy, and ultimately the product of the country. Where those rights are not protected, where there is a lack of certainty around the use of copyright, there's a loss of economic value in the price someone is prepared to pay for the works, which then leads to that a lack of business development, job losses, and harm to the economy. In general, as we mentioned by the presenters, the amendment bill does have a number of flaws, few of which is an unbalance in favor of business, a very open list of exceptions rather than a finite list of specific exceptions. When uh, one looks at the visually impaired, that is one area where the current act is lacking. The Marrakesh Treaty, however, when it proposed that, uh, that the visually impaired can be addressed, did not do so as a blanket right. Once again, it's in a case where there are no accessible format copies available, and then the right gets activated. When one looks at the hybrid fair use fair dealing approach, I think it's been mentioned before, it is likely to result in endless litigation. The US is the poster child of fair use, averages between 2,000 and 5,000 copyright infringement cases per annum. And that is why it is a distinct problem with approaching fair use uh, as currently is in film. But when we look at the broadcasting sector specifically, uh, one of our key concerns is the one size fits all approach of the bill. The bill proposes this approach, which is very unsuitable for the creative world in general and television, um, based on recommendations in the Fulham Commission. One should be bear in mind that the Fulham Commission only focused on music rights and problem contracts and issues in regards to music rights. And from that single area, provisions in this act have been extrapolated, which affect all other sectors, TV, film, graphic design, the publishing sector. There's no concern for the disruption in the value chains in those sectors, not to mention no regulatory impact assessments or socioeconomic assessments have been done for impacts in all those sectors, whether it be at provincial or national level. The bill has given the minister very wide, vague, and unfettered powers to prescribe compulsory, which means and standard, a norm or an average, contractual terms to be included in those agreements. The minister would be empowered to write these contract terms, which parties would have no right but to adhere to, regardless of whether they are appropriate for their context or circumstances. It also proposes a set of royalty rates and tariffs with no regard to the fact that there are other ways of remunerating parties other than royalties. But what causes a constitutional concern is that the bill gives no guidance to the nation to state it is unfettered power on what should be in the country or how these royalties should be determined. And this is what makes it unconstitutional and makes the bill itself vulnerable to the challenge if I causing further delays. The other concern is that these provisions are also very highly impractical. The determination of royalty rates and tariffs are at the very top of contractual negotiations for television. And those negotiations are very complex, nuanced, and context specific, which are not very suited for a one size fits all approach. For example, a lead performer in the work could have a clause in a season one contract that creates a bonus in season two, which is based on the performance of season one. And there are a wide range of performers, extras, voice actors, lead performers in a drama, performances in a music video, appearances in an advert, reality contest, contestants, etc. How should the minister take consideration of all of these in standard tariffs and royalty rates? Standard contracts are not appropriate for the sector and will slow down the pace at which content can be produced. Questions to ask is how will the minister's terms cater for all the different types of copyright works, such as scripts, music compositions, performances, audiovisual content, 
which spans adverts, documentaries, films, TV series, animation. How can standard contracts reflect the nuances with production? It's not possible for the minister to differentiate between an established star who would be rightfully paid more versus an unknown newcomer. It's also important to mention from an international perspective, Hollywood itself doesn't work according to government draft contracts. And so these standard contracts and rates are likely to deter investors. Once again, these each production is unique. Even where the content of a production is the same, we have different costs, different investors, different funding models, different locations, different languages, different source material, different music tools, and I could go on and on. And this is why parties must have the freedom to negotiate their own agreements to address the unique nature of each production. But I think we can all say we appreciate what it is the bill is trying to deal with, being unfair contract terms in a creative industry. But rather than give the minister a wide and unfettered power to decide how everyone should do business, it is proposed the bill should rather follow the which allows unfair terms and contracts to be set aside. We therefore propose that provisions giving the minister the power to set contract terms and prescribe royalty rates or tariffs in the copyright bill should be given. Instead, one should look at how the tribunal itself could be empowered to set aside contractual terms that are manifestly unjust and unreasonable. Bear in mind that if the tribunal in such a case were to make a single ruling and an, on an unfair term, it would apply to all countries, not just the single case, and would therefore have an additional advantage to create uncertainty around contracts. It would also allow the role players the flexibility to negotiate deals that suit the unique nature of each production, at the same time safeguarding against unscrupulous terms, which is what is the intention of the legislature. We have made draft proposals in this regard, uh, which we have supplied as part of our written submission. Another area in the bill, which also relates to contract terms, is that Section 39B of the bill wants to make contract certain contractual terms unenforceable. Once again, we appreciate that the bill is trying to ensure that particular rights, which are now being introduced in this bill, to the Act to protect authors, should not be capable of. Announced. That is not the way that Section 9 currently stands. The provisions are loosely framed and may have far reaching unintended consequences. Right now, it will keep the creators from commercializing their rights even where they want a contract which might be to protect their commercial interests. Bear in mind what we mentioned about the economic purpose of copyright at the beginning it is so that the owners of copyright. Use, sell, or license a work to a third party. It makes no sense to restrain that purpose, which underlies why the legal right is created in the first place by the state. And this is likely to cause considerable difficulties for all parties, including the individual creators and performers, who are trying to get the best deal that they can. And once again, we understand that the intention is to deal with unfairness. And have to help to make Section 39B more workable and equitable. We propose that it is amended to provide that a contractual term, once again, can be made unenforceable if the tribunal makes a finding that the term unfairly renounces a right or protection. And this way, it would allow the parties to renounce a right or protection in circumstances where they have received an equitable remuneration for doing so. And we have made our proposals in this regard in our written. Another key issue is that performing issues should not be in the copyright law. The copyright law has conferred protection rights on performers, but it overlaps substantially with the performers' protection rules, which is likely to cause confusion, duplication, and likely litigation in the future when one has a problem of conflict acts that came out at the same time. And one way that it causes conflict is that it speaks only of royalties. Unlike the performance bill, which in line with the Beijing Treaty, 
addresses both royalties and technical remuneration. We support the appropriate initiatives to ensure the fair remuneration of performers. The concerns about audiovisual performers not being paid fairly can be better dealt with through the performance law. It does allow more flexibility for alternative remuneration methods in addition to what it is. So the performance protection legal is the appropriate statutory instrument to deal with performance rights, and it already does so. And therefore, we propose the the performance protection provision from the copyright law and the rest in the performance law. Alternatively, if these provisions are retained in the copyright law, they must be amended to reduce the confusion and duplication of the performance protection amendment law and to provide for royalties or equitable remuneration as the performance amendment law currently does for the design of the basic. One of the big concerns of the bill is that internet piracy is not dealt with at all. This is very surprising because internet piracy is a global threat to the copyright industry, and everyone in the back chain matters. Revenue leakage from piracy negatively impacts everyone along the value chain. Different services and technologies have come into being, well, since 1978, and even now, since this bill was initially introduced. Parliament in the Different services and technologies, live streaming, which is being enjoyed by pirates, are not being addressed. Let me give a key example. When a live broadcast of a female soccer match is streamed by pirates, the harm is immediate. It falls down the value chain, it affects the broadcasters, the advertisers, sports associations, and even the players. It can't be dealt with 24 hours later by removal of a stream. It requires preventive action. And it's very concerning that this is not being addressed in the bill. We're now a decade behind those developments. Problems in dealing with internet piracy require urgent legislative attention. And at a bare minimum, the bill should include provisions for a streamlined and fast-track proposal for the removal, takedown, and site blocking of internet service providers without the need to approach the court to protect everyone in the value chain. Have included fairly extensive um, proposals in this regard in our written submission. But I'll now hand over to my colleague Laura Cantor to address concerns around the performance protection. Chair, good afternoon. Good afternoon to the committee. I hope that my audio is a little clearer than Anan's. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This is much more clearer. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're, I think we're about to be load shed here at the office. So if I disappear for a few seconds, that is why. But I hope that um, the generators will kick in and I, you won't lose me for too long. So I'm going to talk uh, briefly on our comments on the Performance Protection Amendment Bill. And our comments on this bill are a little different to our comments on the Copyright Bill. Anna, you can move to the next slide. Um, our comments on this bill are a little different to our comments on the copyright bill because we believe that this bill is less problematic and it's broadly in line with the applicable treaties. So we therefore think that this bill could, with some important but manageable amendments, proceed to finalisation. So Chair, we're all aware we don't have a lot of time today, so we're just going to highlight two matters in the Performers Bill, which we think require urgent attention in order for uh, the bill to proceed. The first issue is the need to make the reporting requirements and the fines that are associated with those requirements more reasonable. And the second issue is this issue of how to ensure fair contractual terms for performers but to do so in a way that doesn't impose a one-size-fits-all approach, which, which we really believe strongly that one-size-fits-all approach won't work for our industry. So turning first, <clears throat> excuse me, to this issue of reporting requirements, what the bill does is it sets new requirements for broadcasters to register and report on every broadcast of a performance and provide such report to every performer concerned. Now, we believe that this provision is really so irrational and burdensome that it's going to be practically impossible to comply with. 
For instance, the proposal doesn't take into account the huge volume of content that we're concerned with. So multi-choice is just one broadcaster. We broadcast over 150 channels. This would result in almost 5 million broadcasts of individual performances every month needing to be registered and reporting on, reported on. And it would obviously be even higher for on-demand platforms such as Showmax. So we believe really that this new section is so unduly burdensome that it's unlikely um, to pass constitutional muster. And we're also a bit concerned that the provisions are actually unnecessary because when you think about it, for a performance to be broadcast, the performer would have already entered into an agreement with the copyright owner and that agreement would set out the remuneration to which that performer is entitled. So it's unclear to us why we need to create such an onerous registration and reporting regime. In our view, the bill is really just imposing a massive administrative burden on users and even on performers who at the end of the day are gonna be swamped with paperwork. The fines for non-compliance with the reporting requirements are also problematic. So the bill proposes a minimum fine of 10% of annual turnover. And in our view, this is far too high for failing to submit a report or, or submitting a report a bit late. And it's also unclear to us why failing to submit a report should be a criminal offence. The penalties also far exceed those fines set out in the Act for parties who have actively infringed copyright, which is obviously far more serious. In fact, they even exceed the fines set out in the Competition Act, where the maximum fine for prohibited cartel conduct is 10% of turnover. It's our strong submission that a fine must be proportionate to the severity of the act. And in our view, these fines are so unreasonable and irrational that once again, they're unlikely to pass constitutional muster. Now, Chair, as you've heard throughout our presentation, we didn't wanna come here today and point out the problems only. We wanted to give you some ideas on how the problems can be fixed. And we think in some ways they can be fixed quite easily. So on this issue of reporting requirements, we support the principle that performers must have equitable remuneration in respect of their works and should have visibility in how their performances are used. And we understand that that is what the bill is trying to achieve, but we think there's a better way of doing it. So instead of requiring these onerous reporting requirements currently in the bill, we say that the bill should make a provision for the compilation of an annual usage report, which could then be provided but within a reasonable time after being requested. And we also say there should obviously be no requirement for prior registration. On fines, we say that the maximum fine should be 100,000 Rand and it should be left to the tribunal to determine the quantum. And here I'll again direct you to our drafting proposals that we've made in this regard. In terms of um, this issue of contractual terms, so like the copyright bill, this bill is also concerned with unfair contractual terms and how best to address them. Now, we've already explained that giving the minister unguided powers to set all contract terms is problematic. And we've taken you through why this one size fits all approach is impractical and unworkable for the audiovisual industry, which is so highly collaborative and includes so many different types of works. In the context of the copyright bill, our solution was to empower the tribunal to deal with unfair contract terms. But in the context of this performance bill, we have a different solution. And here we propose that there is a role that can be played by the minister in the protection of performers. Our proposal for the performance bill is that it should empower the minister to prescribe a list of items which should be included in all agreements with performers. So for example, the minister could direct that parties must agree on their respective rights and royalties or equitable remuneration, uh, the method and timing of payments, the duration of the agreements, even a dispute resolution mechanism. But the minister should not specify what the agreements on rights is or what the royalty rate is to be paid. And that's a crucial distinction. So in terms of our proposal, the minister would be able to specify that the agreements deal with the issues that are of concern to performers. 
but the bill would also safeguard the flexibility of role players to negotiate freely and operate with minimal red tape, which is so important for investment in our sector. So we believe that our proposal is a win-win. It balances oversight with flexibility. And crucially, it also addresses the constitutional concerns regarding the minister's unfettered powers. And again, Chair, our drafting proposals are contained in our written submission, and we hope you'll find them helpful. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Colin to conclude our presentation. Thank you, thank you, Lara. Thank you, Anan. And Chair, we are really thankful for the opportunity to comment on, on the bills and we reiterate our support for their objectives. You've heard our constructive proposals from Anan and Lara, and we trust that you will consider them in, our, in your deliberations and you will ensure that we have bills that promote investment in local television content and the broader creative sector so we can create more opportunities for young women like Yolanda in the example that I gave with Survivor and the, hundred, and the other 167 people who got jobs in the rural communities in the Wild Coast last year. We need to enable more of our stories to be told to the world and for South Africans to continue enjoying more shows like The River, Empire, Real Housewives of Tebeja, Umkoka, and so much more. Much has been said about the long legislative process we've been involved in with these bills. Therefore, to move forward, we implore the committee to de-link the two bills and rather implement certain key amendments which are critical for the two bills to progress. The copyright bill, despite its admirable objectives, is very problematic. We have proposed key minimum amendments to address the most problematic issues for the bills to progress. Whilst the Performance Protection Amendment Bill is manageable and less problematic and only requires a few amendments in specific instances. And let's not miss the opportunity to deal with piracy. The time is now to address internet piracy. We also refer you to our drafting proposals in Annexure A of our written submission. And lastly, we leave you with this summary of the minimum issues which in our view must be addressed for the two bills to progress. Thank you for this opportunity, Chair, and for listening to our presentation. We're happy to take any questions from yourself and, uh, and the members of the committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Colin and your team for, uh, the, for the comprehensive presentation that you, that you, that you have made. Uh, uh, particularly uh, leaving us with minimum uh, amendments <laughs> that uh, the view that uh, if they were to be addressed, uh, there will be minimal disruption in moving forward. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just, Thank just, you. just one question. Just one question from my side uh, on the. Uh, on, 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 on the. On the assertion that uh, uh, the the introduction of fair artists and fair use uh, is in the best interest of the the uh, uh, wider section of our community and uh, and the fact that uh, in countries like USA and the EU countries uh, have a fair royalties and, uh, and a fair use provision, uh, and also exceptions uh, that uh, I get a sense that uh, uh, you also have a reservation about. Uh, the, the last one, uh, uh, <clears throat> Pro, I mean, uh, the promotion of the uh, of the progress of science and useful arts, knowledge through a temporary monopoly for authors and creators to protect their works from uses might impact uh, on their livelihoods. I think the the uh, the key issue to 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 me is how do you balance this? 
you must look to your starting point is that indeed there is a need. There is a need to review the copyright amendment bill and the performance protectors amendment bill. Uh, but the, the challenge is uh, the issues around uh, disincentivizing uh, the, the work that uh, you commission the producers. Uh, obviously, I think uh, a key, key to us is the chain, is the supply chain between the producer and performers and others. Because from your side, you commission the producers to produce a series, you see. How do you ensure that uh, uh, given the, the concerns that you raise, but also how do you ensure that the that the there is a there is a broadening of the of the of